How are you doing this evening? My name is Les Markham and I'm one of the pastors here at Surrey Pentecostal Church and we are so glad that you have joined us this evening. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to comment in the chat line beside your picture there. And if you would like prayer, we would be delighted to pray with you. So just call us at the church office. The number is 604 574 24 Oh, three. Well, I don't know about you, but uh, I've heard just about enough about the virus. Uh, it would be kind of nice, I think, to hear some of the other news that's happening in the world. And uh, every evening we get the countdown on how many are sick and how many have recovered. And our hearts do go out to those who have suffered loss. We do pray that they will know the comfort of the Lord. But I thought maybe this evening I would start out with a, something just a little bit lighter. And I have here a poem that was written by Robert Service. Robert Service was an Englishman that ended up in the Yukon during the gold rush and wrote poems like The Cremation of Sam McGee. But this one is simply called Grin. Now, smile is turning the corners of your mouth in an upward direction. And I think we're all capable of doing that. In fact, I understand it takes less muscles to smile than it does to frown. So here's Robert Service's poem. If you're up against a bruiser, like COVID, and you're getting knocked about, just grin. If you're feeling pretty groggy, and you've licked and you're licked beyond a doubt, just grin. Don't let them see you're failing, but let them know that with every clout, even though your face is battered, your blooming heart is stout. Just stand upon your pins and let the beggar knock you out, and then grin. You see, this life is a royal battle, and the same advice holds true. If you're up against it badly, and it's got one up on you, just grin. If the future's black as thunder, don't let the people see you're blue. Just cultivate a cast iron smile of joy and smile the whole day through. Rise up early in the morning with the will that smooth or rough you'll win. Then sink to sleep at midnight and even though you're feeling tough, still grin. There's nothing gained by whining and you're not that kind of stuff. You're a fighter from a way back, and you won't take no rebuff. Your trouble is that you just don't know when to when you've had enough. If fate should knock you down again, then just get up and take another cuff. But don't give in. You can bank it on this. There is no philosophy better than a bluff. So grin. Somebody said, a smile is like a carnation in the lapel of life. So even in our struggles, even in our isolation, uh, we can grin even if it's only to ourselves or to our family. Well, I think maybe I better get to the Bible. So I'm reading this evening from Acts chapter 6. If you have your Bible handy, I would encourage you to open to this chapter because it'll be helpful if you can follow along in whatever translation or version that you have. Reading in Acts chapter 6 beginning at verse 1. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against those who were the Aramaic speaking community because their widows were not being were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve, that would be the apostles, gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. So brothers, choose seven men from among you who, who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them and will give them and give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group, 
And so they chose, and I won't go through the names of the men they chose, but it says in verse 6, And then they presented these men to the apostles, who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread, and the numbers of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Let's just ask God's blessing on our time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the inspired word of God. And now we do pray that you would illuminate truths to our hearts and help us, Lord, to not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word as well. So, Lord, I pray for every individual, young, old, big and small, that's listening to this time together tonight. And I pray blessing on them and their homes. And we pray, Father God, that on, in our words and in our actions, we will honor you in all we do. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, just before I get into uh, Acts chapter 6 and talk a little bit about church governance and church administration, I, I want to give a little bit of a background from Acts chapter 5. Now, some might suggest that church administration is not a very spiritual topic, but I remember a few years ago I was in a conference for church leaders and Charles Crabtree, who was the assistant superintendent for the Assemblies of God in America at that time, said this, which kind of struck me. He said, God hates bad church administration because it has the same negative effect as bad preaching. Souls are lost from the kingdom of God. So spiritual uh, ad administration is spiritual in, in, in that regard. I, I was... Uh, teaching a group of Thai pastors a few years ago on how to structure and organize a church. And after I had given my presentation, a Finnish missionary who was in the group came up to me after and said, the less, that was a very interesting talk. Too bad it was all wrong. Well, the Finnish church was structured a little differently than our churches in Canada, and he felt that his church structure was better and so the question does arise, which structure is the best? Well, we'll talk about that in a moment. But right now, just to give me a bit of a background from Acts chapter 5, you remember that we established last week that the church is not perfect. Sometimes we'd like to think we're pretty close, but the fact is the church is made up of imperfect people. And so problems do arise in the church today, and they did in the early church as well. We read about two bad apples in that early church by the names of Ananias and Sapphira, who uh, did not live up to their Christian values or testimony. Now, let me just say that uh, the church is not the only place that harbors hypocrites. There's a few bad apples have slipped into the police force from time to time, and a few less than reputable people have even snuck into government, where some of them seem to put their own personal interest ahead of the public good. But uh, perhaps there is no hypocrisy that is more egregious than when somebody pretends to be righteous when they're not. Pious or pretended piety irritates people and I'm sure it upsets God. So Ananias worked together in collusion and tried to lie to God. The Bible says in Acts chapter 5, they lied to God and then they lied to the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says, you know, you can be sure that your sin will find you out. And that was certainly the case in their story. Now, the end of everyone who fails God may not be as dramatic or as drastic as it was for Ananias and Sapphira. They fell dead on the spot. I've sometimes wondered if God dealt with us as severely as he dealt with them. I wonder how many of us would still be around. But you see, it was the beginning of a new era. It was beginning, the beginning of the dispensation of grace. And God had to establish that even though he was in and is in the forgiving business, sin is still sin, still is still wrong in the sight of God. And I believe he wanted to establish that fact early 
in the church age. I guess all of us struggle a little bit with the Ananias and Sapphira syndrome. We all, as somebody said, desire to gain the highest credit we possibly can for ourselves, even though we're not prepared to pay the necessary cost. Let me just say that again. Sometimes our sinful natural desire is to gain the highest credit for ourselves at the lowest possible cost. Let's remember too that nothing will sap the spiritual energy of a church or destroy and tarnish the testimony of Christians quicker than sinning Christians in the pew. Well, because of that early church's response and Peter's reaction especially, and in particular, that problem was addressed directly and decisively and the church moved on. There was further miracles and salvations and healings and further persecution. And why did the church face that persecution? Well, in Acts chapter 5, verse 17, it says, because the religious leaders were jealous of the favor and the influence that the apostles were having. And so in Acts chapter 5, verse 18, it says that they threw the apostles into prison. It's interesting, in verse 18, the religious leaders throw them into prison, but in verse 19, the very next verse, God sends an angel and leads them out of prison. Those early Christians were pretty slippery characters. Several times they were thrown into jail and several times God sets them free. In Acts chapter 5, an angel leads them out. And then in Acts chapter 12, Peter is in prison and an angel comes and has to wake him up. James has already been killed by Herod and it's interesting that Peter's able to sleep even though he knows it's the night before his execution probably. But an angel has to wake him up and the chains fall off. One commentator says as light as feathers and the doors fly open even before electronic doors were invented. And the angel let him up. Peter had to pinch himself when he got out into the street to see if this was really real. But God delivered him from prison. And then again in Acts chapter 16, we see that Paul and Silas were singing and praising God at midnight. And an earthquake uh, caused all of the prison doors to fly open. God has the ability to set the prisoner free. It's kind of a fun story though in Acts chapter 5 because apparently the guards don't realize that their prisoners have been released. And the next morning they go to get them out of jail and they said, well, they're not here. Like, what happened? They're, they're gone. And uh, they found them in the temple court preaching to the people. And the leaders, I thought we told you that you weren't supposed to do that. And Peter again answers, well, sometimes we have to obey God rather than man. And uh, then uh, the, uh, the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders, respond in a typical fashion. They don't know what to do, but they beat them up anyway. They flog them and, and order them again. Now don't do that anymore. But in verse 41 it says, the apostles left the prison praising the Lord. Not that God had released them, not that they had escaped the death sentence, but they praised God that he had counted them worthy to suffer and to be persecuted for the sake of Jesus. Well, we move now to Acts chapter 6. But uh, just to, to remind ourselves that God is in the business of helping people in need. I wonder if you have ever felt like you were imprisoned. You see, most of the chains that bind us are not physically visible, but they are chains that we place upon ourselves. But God has come through the person of Jesus to set us free. Jesus, when at the beginning of his ministry in Luke chapter 4, quotes this from Isaiah chapter 61. He says, The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to proclaim freedom for prisoners to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And in John chapter 8, Jesus said, Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. If you feel that you are 
constrained or restrained or imprisoned by some emotion or some habit, let me just assure you that Jesus is in the business of setting people free. Now in chapter 6, the church faces another challenge, another problem. Both chapter 5 and chapter 6 of the book of Acts begin with a problem. But both chapters end with victory. And I'm glad that that's the order, that it isn't in reverse, that it starts with a victory and ends with a problem. But one of the things that I do like about the Bible is that it's very candid and honest. It portrays life as it really is. It, it has the ring of reality. It doesn't sugarcoat events or people. And in Acts chapter 6, we have the first record of internal strife in the early church. And uh, for the rest of our time together, I'd like to consider the character of the problem that arose, the cause of the problem, and then the cure for the problem. First of all, what was the nature of the problem? Well, as our text made clear, it concerned widows. Those would be the women who had lost husbands for whatever reason, but we could expand it and say it includes all those who are needy and all those who ha have lost a means of livelihood because in, in that culture and in that time, for a woman to lose her husband meant that her means of support was gone. And so uh, the disciples decided that they would minister to these people, which was the right and the biblical thing to do. You see, God has a tender spot in his heart for the poor and the needy. Uh, last week I quoted from Jim Cantillon, uh, a pastor who served many years in Africa working with the AIDS people, who said, God finds people who care for and care about the poor irresistible. If we have the heart of God, we will care about widows and about orphans and the poor and the needy. Bob Pierce, who started World Vision, said this, let my heart be broken with the things that break the heart of God. So first of all, the problem in the early church that we're talking about involved widows. Secondly, it involved the distribution of food. Now you'll recall perhaps that back in Acts chapter 4, the Bible says that the people who had land sold it and they brought the money and they laid it at the apostles' feet so that it could be distributed to the needy in their midst. Now, you probably know that people can get very touchy when it comes to the subject of money. They can get even more touchy when it comes to the topic of food, especially the lack of it. And so these people were on a rather delicate, in a delicate area of life. Uh, now the problem wasn't that they weren't getting any food. The problem wasn't even that they weren't getting enough food. The problem is some other people were getting more food. It wasn't, it was the problem is we are not getting as much as those other people. They were complaining and comparing themselves with others and they felt that they were getting the short end of the stick whether it was intentional or not. Now when it comes to the division of goods we have to be very careful. I, I heard about two men who were discussing a piece of pie. See, there was two men and there was just two pieces. And uh, Joe said to Tom, well, Tom, you, you go first. And so Tom took the big piece. Joe was upset. He said, Tom, you took the big piece. And uh, Joe said, but, uh, uh, but I thought that uh, I had the choice. And Tom said, yeah, but if you're first, you're supposed to take the little piece. And Joe said, well, didn't you get the little piece? And Yes. Well, then why aren't you satisfied? Uh, if you have children and you have to divide a piece of cake, the best policy is to let one child cut it and the other child choose first. That way you can be guaranteed that that piece is going to be cut as close to the middle as possible. Uh, the problem is sometimes when we compare with our, ourselves with others, we, we believe that somehow they got an advantage. They got just a little bit more. I heard, and this is an actual case, I heard about a church that actually split because 
one man got a bigger piece of ham at the church picnic than somebody else. Well, sometimes we allow these petty things to divide us. And the third part of the problem was that the uh, Grecian believers felt that they had been overlooked. Whether it was intentional or not wasn't significant. The thing is they felt like they had been neglected. Have you ever felt like somehow you were overlooked? That uh, you didn't receive your just reward or your just desert? Uh, just remind yourselves of Joseph, yourself of Joseph in the Old Testament. He had a very difficult time and none of it was of his own making. He was overlooked. Think of, of David, King David. Uh, when Samuel came to anoint somebody to be the king, his own family overlooked him. And, and Samuel had to actually say to, his, to uh, David's father, isn't there anybody else? And his dad said, oh, oh yeah, actually there is this boy out in the field. Uh, sometimes we are overlooked by people, but God sees and knows all things. So whether their complaint was legitimate or not in the early church, the tension that rose was real. The fourth problem was that they had allowed this tension to, to form groups within the church. One group were Greek-speaking Christians. They were followers of the Hellenistic or the Greek culture. And most of them had come from outside of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, in the northern part of Israel, there's t there were ten cities called the Decapolis, and it was basically Greek in its culture and in its language. But the other group in this early church were mostly from Jerusalem. They were Aramaic speaking. Now, everybody in Israel could usually speak a little bit of Hebrew because that was a language of religion. But when they were talking over the back fence, they would talk in Aramaic. And so there was this language division. And they had allowed this to formulate cliques and camps within the church. I'm so glad that our church is multicultural. And I'm glad that we can dwell together as brothers and sisters in Christ. But in this early church, the question soon became, which side are you on? Which camp do you belong to? Which party are you going to vote for? Somebody has said, a divided church is the devil's playground. In Psalm 133, the Bible says how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity, for that is where God will command his blessing. If we're going to get this gospel boat moving, then we have to all paddle and we have to all paddle in the same direction. The Thai people have an expression that says if you're not going to paddle, please don't drag your foot in the water. If you're not going to work in harmony, then please just step aside. The problem was there was a division in two different groupings in the early church. And then the fifth part of the problem was they didn't handle it very well. They began to murmur among themselves. The original picture language is they began to talk behind their hands. He got a bigger hamburger than I did. She got more french fries than I did. Well, probably they didn't have McDonald's or Burger King, but uh, they began to complain and to murmur. Remember the children of Israel in the wilderness wanderings? They complained about a lot of different things, and that was one of the reasons why they never got into the promised land sooner than they did. Because friends, gossip magnifies a problem. You know, well, he said, well, she said, well, he thinks, and it, we get it second hand and third hand. And this improper response simply makes the problem worse. It magnifies the difficulty. James in the Bible tells us that the tongue, even though it is a small member of the body, can make get us into big trouble. Remember, it only takes a little spark to talk, to start a big fire. And somebody said it this way, be very careful that your tongue doesn't slip, because remember, it is in a wet place. Well, we've described the nature of this problem in the early church. Let's look for a moment at the cause of the problem.
Part of the cause was the church was growing very rapidly. Now, growth is a wonderful thing. In fact, if the church is healthy, it should grow because the church is a living organism and living things, if they're healthy, they grow. But growth, especially rapid growth, brings with it some additional administration problems. And the difficulty in the early church is that it had grown to 5,000 men at least, maybe 15, maybe 20,000 people, and more people were being added daily. It was just too much for the 12 disciples or apostles to handle by themselves. The church had outgrown its structure. Now, until Acts chapter 6, there's no mention of church governance or church administration. The 12 apostles just handled the, the whole things by, them, by themselves. But now the problem had grown beyond them. Part of the problem was spiritual, but part of the problem was administrative. Then part of the problem, too, was language. Now, the people could have communicated with one another because they probably all knew some Greek and they probably all knew some Aramaic, but they had developed into these clans because it was just more comfortable to communicate people who understood them well and with whom they could chat easily. So language was a part of the issue. But another part of the problem was hurt feelings. There was misunderstanding and misinterpretation. Some felt like they had been neglected, that they had been perhaps intentionally slighted, and they took offense. Church divisions more often are caused by hurt feelings than by doctrinal differences. I was uh, speaking at a camp once with a pastor from Oregon by the name of Denny Davis, and he shared a story about a lady in his church who came up to him one Sunday and said, Pastor Davis, I know you don't like me, but I'm going to like you anyway. And he said, so what do you mean I don't like you? And she said, well, a couple of weeks ago, you saw me walking up the sidewalk towards church and you turned and walked away from me. He said, I'm sorry, but I don't remember that. But it was probably because I had some other responsibility I had to attend to. It in no ways was intended to be a slight or an insult to you. John Bevere has written a book called The Bait of Satan. And this book shares that one of the problems that sometimes arises in the church is that we so easily take offense, sometimes when it's not even intended. So what was the cure? Well, first of all, they had to communicate. When this problem was brought to the attention of the apostles, I'm glad to say they listened. They listened carefully. They're, they strove to understand the people's perception. One of our problems is that we don't listen enough. Maybe there's a reason why God gave us two ears and only one mouth. Maybe we should listen more and talk less. Well, the apostles heard the problem and they didn't take offense. They didn't get defensive. They were approachable. The problem was that uh, this problem could have easily been resolved sooner if the people had simply brought it to the leadership sooner. So a meeting is called in verse 2 of chapter 6. It says they called everybody together. They had a town hall meeting. The grievances were expressed. Their concerns were aired. And a decision was reached. And that decision was accepted by everyone. Somebody has said, most of our people problems are really communication problems. That's not always the case. But oftentimes it's because we haven't really listened. We haven't really heard one another. Lauren McAllister, the, uh, one time the district superintendent in Alberta, used to say, people who are equally informed seldom differ. Well, sometimes they do, but communication was part of the solution. Another part of the answer was priorities were as clearly established. Now, serving tables or waiting on the needs of the needy people was important to the early church. 
Their feelings were important, but the apostles' calling and their responsibility and their divine job description did not include waiting on tables. Their primary responsibility was to preach and to pray. Not necessarily in that order, but to pray and to preach. To care for the spiritual needs of the people. If you were to ask me, uh, what is the responsibility of a pastor? I would say that in the, in the New Testament, the word pastor and shepherd are used interchangeably. So the, the ministry of a pastor is to feed the sheep, to lead the sheep, to protect the sheep, and to love the sheep. The pastor's job is not necessarily to chauffeur church members. It's not necessarily to buy the groceries for people. It's not necessarily to babysit those who need someone to care for their children. The primary ministry of the pastor is to present the Word of God and to listen to the voice of the Lord. So they, the apostle said in verse 2, it is not right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God. But here's what we will do. We will delegate the responsibility and the authority to seven men who will take care of the widows. We see from this the supremacy of the spiritual, but also the sanctity of the secular. They are not saying that waiting on tables wasn't important. It just was not their direct uh, calling or responsibility. So in verse 3, they, they chose seven men. I don't know exactly how they did it. Uh, I don't know if they drew straws like they did back in Acts chapter 1, but there was some kind of a democratic process. Maybe they had to vote electronically on a Zoom call. Well, that brings us to the question, well, what type of church governance is best? What's the best way to ch choose church leaders? When I was a student in Bible College in California, I did a research paper on the way that different churches select their leaders. I, I think I interviewed people from third grounds. There were Anglicans, there were Presbyterians, there were Baptists, there was Salvation Army people, there were independent churches. And, and the methods of selection varied. Uh, in some cases it was a, an appointment from the top. In some cases it was a matter of family lineage. Father passed it on to son. Sometimes it was a community selection, and sometimes it was a congregational vote. But here's my answer. The best way to choose a church leader is to find and to follow the will of God. Oh, yes, well, that's true, but how is that done? What is the method that we can use to discern the will of God? Well, when the Apostle Paul was planting churches in the New Testament, he told both Timothy and Titus to appoint leaders in the church. Now those churches were very young. They were baby churches. They didn't have a developed leadership yet. So there are times when maybe appointment is the best way. But in Acts chapter 6, the people themselves chose their leaders by some kind of consensus or some kind of vote, uh, they, uh, they made the decision. Now, you and I both know that sometimes the majority of people can be wrong. After all, it was the majority of people that decided to crucify Jesus. But the fact is, individuals can be wrong too. Our personal preferences can be wrong. And so they together made a decision. It's interesting to note that all seven men that were selected to help and to serve had Greek names. And I think that was a nice consensus on the part of the Aramaic or the Hebrew believing people that they chose Greek men to take this responsibility. So I, I think we do have a good system in our church where a, a group of people, a committee selected by the congregation, it might be the church board, it might be a nominating committee, they vet, vet and, uh, and uh, evaluate candidates and then present what they think is the best choice to the congregation and the congregation 
chooses. I like that system. Democracy isn't foolproof. Sometimes mistakes are made. But somebody said it this way, usually democracy is the least worst system. And so here's my conclusion. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly how to choose a leader. That was the difference that arose between me and that Finnish missionary in Thailand. What the Bible does focus on is the qualities of the people we chose, choose as leaders. It's not so concerned about how we choose them as choosing the right kind of leader. You see, if we get the right people with the right qualities and the right character into positions of leadership, it will work, whatever the system is. And if we get the wrong people in those positions of leadership, no system will work well. Now next week we're going to focus a little bit on what should those qualities be like when we look at one of the people that was selected as a leader. So we've talked about the character of the problem, the causes of the problem, and the cure of the problem. But I want to close this evening by talking about the consequences of the problem. Verse 5 says, everybody was pleased. They were happy campers once again. And I'd like to think God was pretty happy with the result as well. Because God desires a healthy church. And God loves a united church that is moving forward in the Lord. And it says then in verse 6 that those that were chosen by the people were endorsed by the apostles. They put their stamp of approval upon the decision that had been made. And another consequence is the church continued to grow. Had a little blimp, had a little bit of a setback, but then pushed on in growth. The natural thing for healthy living organisms organisms is to grow. Did you know that the number one cause for churches not to grow, the number one bottleneck is the attitude of the congregation. A congregation that's status, satisfied with status quo. A congregation that's comfortable with the th way things just are and resist any change that might bring uh, growth into the church. But the church did grow after this decision in Acts chapter 6. Finally, it not only grew in number, but also grew in influence, because the Bible says that many of the priests, many of the leaders, even in the religious world, came to faith in Christ. And finally, this church, a consequence was they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. There was a new outpouring of the power of God, and many wonders and many miracles were performed, and that led to more persecution. And I want to talk about that a little bit again next week when we're going to discuss one of the great leaders of that early church, one of the men that was chosen by this congregation in the city of Jerusalem. I hope you can join us again next week at 7 o'clock. God bless you. It's been great chatting with you today. Stay safe, stay positive, and stay strong in the Lord. God bless. Bye for now.